And another surprise. He's wooing the women of Iraq, religious and secular. Here in Baghdad, Sistani's organization has funded one of the first religious schools to be opened specifically for Shia women. There's been a rush to enroll. Under Saddam, we women had to study religion and the Holy Quran secretly in a mosque. But after the fall of the regime, we noticed that both teachers and students were really enthusiastic about studying Islam. So we didn't have to do anything to attract women to come to classes here. Mr. Sistani's last fatwa said that women should vote and should have a special quota in future parliamentary elections. That means they should occupy 40 seats in the parliament. He looks at women as human beings and looks at their capabilities, not their gender. That is what the Holy Quran asks us to do as well. We're at Baghdad's School of Fine Art. Some of the young female students here had been concerned that the rise of the clerics in post-Saddam Iraq would affect their personal freedoms. Many women are forced to wear the veil because they're worried about their safety and getting raped. Under Saddam, there were no religious leaders and we were not scared. In Saddam's time we lived in a cage, then we were released into the jungle, but we didn't know what to do in the jungle. We are scared of some of the religious leaders. At the beginning of this school year I thought I should wear the veil, but I changed my mind. Ayatollah Sistani understands us. He would like to preserve women's rights. He doesn't want Iraq to be another Iran. The reverence Sistani commands in Iraq is so pervasive it proves impossible to find anyone critical. The Ayatollah wields spiritual power, but he's also the most politically influential man in Iraq. <laughs> We consider him the great one in Iraq. He's the first and foremost object of emulation. We cannot deviate from what he asks us to do. He's a wonderful man. He loves peace and Islam. In the cafes, all the talkers of politics, the trials of occupation, and the transfer of power, and of course, Sistani's likely verdict. <laughs> If Sistani announces jihad, we will force the occupiers out of the country. We will carry out suicide bombings and we will throw ourselves under their tanks. Jihad is one of the most important obligations we have in Islam. It is like fasting, prayers and paying one-fifth of your earnings. But Sistani is no rabble-rouser. He kept silent under Saddam. He's also been silent over the degrading treatment of Iraqis by occupying forces. Yet the Shia are a patient people, and nothing will happen until Ayatollah Sistani says it's time. You should follow your object of emulation in every situation. Ayatollah Sistani is our leader. He knows what to do. Jafar's devotion to Sistani is particularly breathtaking. This is a man who was tortured by Saddam and then detained for six months by American troops along with nine members of his family. The Americans beat us and urinated on us. They took pictures of us. They had a translator and two investigators, but they had no mercy. One of them had an iron bar and he beat us with that. He treated us like animals and ordered me to kiss his shoes. But not all Shia are as patient as Jafar. These angry, unemployed, disenchanted young men are the supporters of Moqtada al-Sadr, the junior cleric who started the Shia uprising in March.
It's Friday prayers in Kufa, just down the road from the city of Najaf, Sistani's hometown and the hearthstone of Shia Islam. Moqtada is to give today's sermon. As we're filming, a firefight breaks out between Moqtada's militia and the Americans, who've been trying and failing to evict Moqtada's forces from Iraq's holy cities. Moqtada al-Sadr and Ali Sistani are neighbors in Najaf, but they're miles apart politically. The uprising was a warning shot of what can happen when the Shia of Iraq disregard the moderation and patience of Sistani. The old Ayatollah sought to calm the fiery young cleric. He appealed to him and the Americans to keep their gun battles away from these, the holiest Shia shrines. Now an uneasy truce is holding, but there's still sporadic rocket and mortar fire. The city, which has been Sistani's home for 50 years, has become a ghost town. Ayatollah Sistani is trying his best to stop the bloodshed. He is asking both the Iraqis and the Americans to settle their arguments through peaceful means. Unfortunately, neither of them listened to him. May God prolong Sistani's life, kill all his enemies, and we condemn anyone who doesn't listen to our object of emulation. While the outside world frets about the way forward now, for most Iraqi Shia, the answer is obvious. Failure to listen to the object of emulation will be a bad omen. Ali Sistani's political stature is destined to grow, as is his spiritual authority as Iraq's moral compass. Whatever direction Iraq's future leaders take, their legitimacy will rest on his seal of approval.